I'll post you. I don't know what that means. Za. V. How are you? Well, that's such a loaded question these days. I didn't mean it. I just, I was, I mean, I, I'm happy to see you. Me too. It's been too long. It's been too long. I'm happy to um, talk to you in general. Uh, you know, I started this podcast. Yes. And we haven't had um, a guest yet. And then, you know, I'm trying to think about, you know, I don't want the first guest to be, I don't want to over um, inflate like, how big of a deal that is or not because it's a new podcast and then you know the format we're still working at the kinks but i thought this would be a very comfortable way to kind of uh uh start that so i'll start a little bit about what i was thinking and then i have some questions for you i'd love to to jump around a little bit to kind of have a a structure mapped out in my head in a way that i think this will help make it make sense to other people so I know you from our mutual uh, kind of uh, employment history and in the field of, you know, education and, uh, and whatnot and something we both still, still do. Um, and that's where we met and became friends. But really, where we have been more involved the past couple of years has been with uh, uh, your kind of new adventure into uh, a new genre of music for you. Music's not new for you by any means. You're a lifelong student of the violin and whatnot, but um, uh, this other uh, uh, foray into hip hop, if I can call it that, if that's okay with you, I don't want to, I don't, you know how people are with genres. So um, I did want to start that, you know, kind of the reason we got talking and then had the idea to do this podcast is we have a mutual friend who we lost recently. And, you know, I want to talk about Mr. Tracy um, uh, for a minute and just kind of uh, your, you know, fond memory of of him. And, you know, I didn't get to spend the time with him that you did mm -hmm. while we were talking. So can you um, just jump in kind of wherever you're comfortable? Well, yeah, we've been knowing each other for about eight years. Yeah. Um, and I didn't realize uh, when I got into music, I didn't know really what a producer was or what a producer did. Sure. And I didn't realize that uh, you work in that capacity in a, in a really great way. And uh, thank you for having me on the show and being your first guest. I feel so honored. I'm so happy. Oh, yeah, it's going to be fun. Tonight. Um, but Mr. Tracy, um, you know, I love roller skating. I'm a big roller skater. I've been roller skating my whole life. Um, but more recently, really seriously. And uh, I have two little girls that are last last summer when I met Mr. Tracy well no, no no I'm sorry I met Mr. Tracy for my when I turned 40 and uh he did the sound at my party mm -hmm. and I probably saw him at the skadium a few other times over the years because he's been affiliated with the skadium for about uh, about nine years Rob was saying he's the owner at the skadium um and I always like the vibe at the skadium you know it's just got that gritty south city really deep like it's it is what it is. Institution. It's a. Uh, it's certainly a relic of of that kind of business model overall. I think it was. I mean, but it still operates kind of that way, even if only in a nostalgia kind of capacity. But they also do hockey and all kinds of. We've had all kinds of weird parties there now. And Rings, roller derbies, hip hop shows. You know, you name it. You um, and anything flies there, and I really like that. That you could let it all hang out. It's the only place I've been in St. Louis where I feel like. You could be in New Orleans or you could be in Amsterdam. It's, like especially that neighborhood is so quiet and kind of no one's gonna ask you what you're doing there. And you can have a it's you know, it's a, a very unique spot. I'm sure every city feels like they have things like that, but right. Yeah. So it's basically an old roller rink that is still Just operational. As that. And and if you want to dream something, Rob is like, Yeah, come on down and do it as long as it's you know low-key and not high-tech you know but then Tracy comes along he's like I've got the sound system you know so last summer I kept seeing I, you know my girls at that time were um five and six years old and I was teaching them how to roller skate and I kept seeing Tracy would have people up and I'm like what are you doing up there what, what's the going loft, on up there? loft area right huh above the studio above the skadium and he's like well it's a studio I record music I'm like oh really He's like, yeah. I'm like, well, I'm 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 a rapper, and he he just scoffed at me, of course, like most people. Do. Sure, sure. And then um, I ended up having the Goddess Awards there last year, and I would come and rehearse there, 
before I started skating at Forest Park every day and he heard me spit in my bars and he's like, you know what, Zaza? You ought to come upstairs. I'm like, it's about time you asked me. It took about two months, you know? And then he ended up recording, um, I don't know, like eight or nine songs with me this past year. And uh, we did an EP together, which I never released um, just because of a lot of things that happened over the summer and just my own, uh, you know, insecurities as an artist or whatever, but we spent a lot of time together just as a, my kids and him, and then also just me and him up in the studio shooting the shit. And he, you know, he told me his life story and it's not, he was a drifter. Um, he was brilliant. He used to rig games and let kids play unlimited, you know, in the neighborhood. He grew up on McRee um, down in the South City. And he always said he didn't have any family, but that just wasn't true. Um, the truth is he, he just, uh, his, his, he wasn't an old guy. He was only 54, but the fact is homelessness over time takes its toll. And even though he, I mean, he mastered, a, he had one hit in his life. He mastered Juju on that beat and got a check for $54,000. And I'm like, Tracy, you know, that's a starter check for something like making something happen, you know? Right. That's yeah. You, you, you try to parlay that into how you want to, you know, but if you don't have those, that training or those skills or somebody in your life with that wisdom, you know what I mean? No, and homelessness and poverty has this way of, um, it, Tracy didn't know his worth. You know, and, and I've talked to at least two dozen rappers this past two weeks since he died, you know, just hearing their stories and gathering information about his obituary, for his obituary. Um, and the, the, the one consistent theme is, is that he always made you feel like you were going to blow up and made you feel like you were onto something, you know, and Rucka Puff, who's now Zeus, Rebel Waters, you know, he, he would just, Tracy's always like, don't forget about me when you blow up, you know, and every rapper I've talked to said, you know, you would just use those words and just make you feel comfortable in the studio. He was real simple. You know, he didn't like fancy doing anything fancy, but he was very good at mastering. He had an excellent ear. Right. That's the hard thing too, is because that was what I learned with the, just a brief time I got to kind of work with him is that he's not super into the chopping things up and the, the yeah. studio part that's super about changing the audio, but he's all about making the audio sound really good. And he has a really great, he really likes things to sound a certain way and he likes bass to hit a certain way, but that's very specific. But um, yeah, just like you're saying, like a very uh, enthusiastic guy, just obviously loved music. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure we're only a couple of, dozens if not hundreds of people that he's gotten to work with even just locally much yeah. less actually having some you know um charted success and whatnot and and the the people he must have met on that ride alone yeah he just mastered zeus's album a few weeks ago you know and he consistently mastered for uh, 25 years as far as i can tell um he never had any formal schooling he became unhoused at 14 and grew up hanging out at the arcade repair shop and that's where he learned all of his gaming habits or habits I, I i don't he never had enough money to be a gambling addict believe me but um he knew how those machines worked and he could retool them i mean the most recent thing he did he at the stadium he rigged up a, a a jimmy jukebox basically you put quarters in and then you hook up to the bluetooth so for 15 bucks you can have unlimited bump and sound with all your own music on it, as long as you put enough quarters in it. Uh, yeah. And his signage around the stadium, you know, just the way he, the way he expressed himself and just the way he was, there's just, a, he was a one, in a one of a kind and, and he was so kind, you he know, was, whenever you walk into the, the um, He was such a part of the spirit of that place for me at least, cause he's been around, hanging around there since, and working out of there since I've been going there. So, you know, it's one of those, like you, it's some of the places you can't disassociate from the the characters that kind of make them special because it would be just a sad building if nobody was doing anything with it and for rob and tracy and, and their team there to um they're kind of that they put the, the life in it so that's i mean that was certainly my experience i don't know what rob's gonna do now man i was there the other day and the dj showed up i'm like good luck man rob's like oh i mean they figured it out but you know it's just not going to be as uh easy to uh 
you know, get that sound system and the stacks. I don't know I mean, if anybody that yeah, hears this institutional memory. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> if anybody's out there that is interested in buying that studio equipment as a lot or all of his sound equipment, which of which there's a lot, um, please do call the Scadium because Rob is interested in in getting um, some of you know, home for that stuff. It, it, it needs a home, and there's some debts to be settled. Um, to for on in Tracy's name and we want to do good by him and um you know yeah but it, it leaves a hole in my heart you know that that upstairs place was a uh, it was a brothel for a while you know like for a lot of years you know and that energy is up there like yeah. the oldest profession in the world is where I recorded some of my grittiest most satisfying songs that I feel very happy with and that's very much, I don't want to name like stereotypes of this kind of thing because um, I mean it in a good way, but like it's a, um, it's very much, it had that gorilla DIY kind of, um, you know what I mean? Like not that he didn't have um, quality gear in there, but it was very much, it was not originally a studio. It was something he was using as his studio at that time. And he had kind of constructed a little vocal booth and it was very mm -hmm. much like a connected to it. There wasn't any like, um, pretense or like uh no. over it you know what i mean it was uh it's motherfucking dirty piece of shit place i'd ever been in and i loved it even though i got eaten alive by bed bugs one day this summer with it mm -hmm. i don't need to know that i've been in there I <laughs> he got rid of the chair and the bed bugs were gone luckily i don't even know though must have been in the chair then uh. so um so we don't certainly have to put that to bed, but uh, I did want to mention, um, so move on to a thing that um, you mentioned in there. I didn't necessarily uh, set up a formal introduction or anything. So we we know each other uh, from our career than from collaborating musically, but so um, kind of update people on what your participation is with your your music currently. And then I want to talk about the journey that we, we um, witness to get there so kind of um are you still zaza g i'm well i'm zaza good break i i mean i was born elizabeth good break mm -hmm. um but i've been za since uh 98 1998 and then in like 2003 someone called me zaza i'm like well i think i like that the best but um za or zaza is what i prefer yeah um, i think I didn't fully grow into my name until, um, of course, we met in 2012 or 2013 yeah. um, when I was pregnant with my first child and you were a student teacher and I was teaching at U City High School and I love U City. I still work at U City. I have a lot of respect for the parents, administration, teachers, coworkers, and students. Like it is my home yeah. and I have respect for all of that. Yeah. However, um, I have this other life. Well, I think all women have uh, two faces at least, yeah. you know, where, uh, and my whole issue was about two years ago, and you witnessed this up close and personal, and this is what makes this conversation so special. And to sit here two years later and like be able to reflect on it is something different than what it was in that moment. But I went to China on a trip so I could take some students to Greece later that year for a trip. And it, you know, it was, it was an all adult trip, which was like going to summer camp for adults. Like it was amazing. I only spent five days in Beijing, but on the Great Wall of China, I literally had some massive shift happen. Now at, with some perspective, I think I had what you would say the best midlife crisis ever. Like it was a, just a explosion of creativity um, partially when, you know, by the time I got the, the next night after I came home, um, I came downstairs and we'd already been messing around with some music a little bit, you know, just, yeah. I yeah. Right yeah. Here. sure, but I don't want to lose the narrative here, but I, yeah. And so I had some interest in, in doing some recordings, but I'd never I'm really jamming, jamming. Yeah. Just throwing just things out there, well, ideas, whatever, really even in a hip hop kind of style as much uh, it, sonically as it was the workflow. And we'll talk about that um, uh, too. But yes, yeah, so we had caught up in my, my home studio. Uh, uh, it was when I lived in Dogtown at the time. Cat Hair Studios in downtown Dogtown. 
in downtown Dogtown, and uh, we were um, kind of mostly catching up and kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, enjoying some libations from abroad and um, kind of had a beat kind of going. And then, uh, yeah, you were, you were saying. Then I, yeah, I got home from China and like the, it was almost like an, something like a door opened. And I'd always been into, po I've always enjoyed poetry. I've been journaling, avid journaler my whole life, um, really enjoy poetry. But something happened that night where I kind of found my flow. And um, it was a one part like sleep deprivation, another part just exhilaration from uh, knowing that, you know, I'd been involved in this 12 year relationship, 10 years of marriage, knowing that that was changing. Um, and just, just sort of, having a, a new chapter open and just this, this door open. And then I started to really catch, um, like, you know, I, all of a sudden I wanted to wear like multiple necklaces and I started wrapping like, I, like it was literally a severe personality break. Like if, if we studied it, like in the psychological lens, it was a severe departure from it. it, it I, I lost my mind for <laughs> You felt the need for some kind of a transformation uh, with how you, especially with how you communicated with, with your, the world around you in your life. And I think pairing that with a totally visually very breathtaking kind of a trip and then yeah. having time in that accelerated abnormal environment, not that you're not a world traveler, but had you ever been to the Great Wall before? No, but that was my 40th country. Yeah. So, right. So it was a, um, uh, a shift for you into a new chapter of your life with age and with your outlook on what things um, in your life could or should look like and then doing that in a in a way where you're kind of hitting a milestone in your travels I think both spiritually and physically I'm okay to saying that yeah absolutely it was like Mario Brothers if you're playing the game like you gather all these different like coins or like mushrooms or whatever like I've been to four of the great you have all kinds of mushrooms. Yeah, all great wonders of the world. I mean, I've drank ayahuasca in the Amazon. You know, I've fucking meditated for 10 days in the mountains. I've been a walk through the desert and, you know, I've been all over. I've been all over. But that was like the last. You know the like, song, um, but I've never been to me. You don't know that song? No. Oh my God, it was in Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. It's all about like- No, 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 now I know it, yes, yes. I've been undressed by kings and I've seen- Anyway, yeah, so sort of some of that energy. I appreciate that song. I had a single mother who listened to that song a lot in the house. So I'm okay with it. I know where you're coming from. Like I felt like my, my not like I need help with my ego, but like I started when I, I okay, so I woke up the next day, I'm like, I need to get into a studio. I'm going to be like, suddenly I, and the, the delusions were really strong. Well, listen, but I, so, so what I really witnessed was I think you kind of discovered an avenue to kind of um, express some of your energy, both frustration and creativity and positive things, not just negative <laughs> in a new way. And, you know, um, it'd be like having all the inspiration built up for something that you don't know how to do yet. But then when you discover it, you're not going to, that's why it's so important for a lot of us to do that in like when we're teenagers, where we're not going to stop because we're so impulsive and driven towards whatever we like anyway. Like if I had really, like, I'm not going to learn to play a new instrument now at 30. Um, then as I did, like when I learned electric guitar and keyboard and stuff, like it was, I could sit there and suck at it for a long time and it was okay. Cause that's part of the journey. Um, and so I think that's also hard because you're already, you, you already know what it sounds like when your violin is the way you want it to sound like, but then to try to do hip hop for the first time, I don't think it's, I think that's an important part of the process is to see what sticks. But the absurd thing was, is I'd never listened to rap a day in my life. I fucking hated it. So then I was like, oh, what am I? I was like, I talked to the universe every night. What the fuck do you want me to do with this? And the universe kept saying, you better get busy. And so I spent, I mean, every time I listened to a new album, I considered that working. 
every time I'm exposing myself to a new cadence or rhythm or artist, it is my work because I'm consistently looking for a sound and finding my flow. And believe me, what you didn't like about was some of the more toxic aspects of the hip hop culture that people talk about, like the some of the misogyny and the uh, um, violence, yeah, the, yeah, and the kind of uber masculine tendencies in some of it, and the yeah, the violence in some of it, and and, and which so that's the part you didn't connect with, but what you did connect with was the way to to lock in emotions and communicate that way. Lyrical storytelling is one of the oldest forms of art in ever, right? And I think it's a beautiful thing to uh, deliver a story with a nice cadence and of course drum and beat and melody is just, you know, it, it, it's the essence of music and, and lyricism is, you know, I can't sing of course. So when I found that I could be a performer without having to carry a tune, I'm like, oh, this is perfect. Sure. Because I can't sing, I really can't. And so, um, but also the, the, my biggest problem, not the misogyny and not the violence, because I am a guest in the hip hop industry. Um, the four pillars of hip hop, I was not raised with. I'm raising my daughters in those four pillars. But the thing is, I wasn't raised in, you know, in the hood. I wasn't raised, uh, I was, you know, I was raised very conservative Catholic to, to parent family. Um, in this fucking suburbs, no one wants to fucking hear about that. Um, although it doesn't, it, it ultimately doesn't matter where you're from. It depends on, it, it matters how you tell your story and how you deliver your message. Subject matter. My biggest problem is, is that rappers can, including Megan Thee Stallion's new album, the system consistently glorifies. <sighs> okay, I'm sorry. Rap music consistently glorifies a system that can, inherently <sighs> fails its subscribers. Yeah. Um, so this whole obsession with wealth, this whole obsession with advancement and with luxury, um, I have a major task. I'm, I just don't, I don't care for it. Like Cardi B was just talking about, I love Cardi B. I love Megan Thee Stallion. I just adore them. But Cardi B has 500 pairs of shoes and her boyfriend has 3,200. This is not. Well, and this is something we talked about last week on, on this show is that um, uh, we can only f flaunt the wealth so much before the people that, that can't get a knee operation or can't um, feed their kids, they're going to start asking, hey, can we not with the this and then that? You know what I mean? We were talking about, um, you know, I have kids at, uh, in my district where I work that go home with food from school every day to take home to their family, which is a great program. I'm so glad we do it. Sure. And Kim Kardashian celebrated her 40th birthday on a, like a million dollar island getaway with like 40 people in the middle of a pandemic. And I'm not saying don't do that. But do we can we kind of be like I have a my family was Catholic growing up. So I have some of that shame and guilt complex that you and me joke about so much that like keep it a secret. Like, don't let them take a picture of you on the beach that you just closed. You know what I mean? Oh, no, motherfucker. Better yet. Why are we glorifying a system that consistently fails its subscribers? If we can't, and this is my whole thing since I was four years old when I had my, I was very politically conscious from a very young age. I've been arrested a bunch of times for civil disobedience. I've been a political activist for 27 years. I am very concerned that as humans, we all do the same five things every day, right? We have more in common than not, the same five fucking things. But we can't seem to just provide a bathroom for every human on the planet with a basic amount of calories for people to consume. We have failed the species. Yeah, I you know what, that's one thing we say on this show all the time, and forgive my French, but people like to eat and they like to shit. You know what I mean? That's it. You know what I mean? Can we let them? Fuck. Oh yeah, they could, I mean, occasionally, nowadays people are doing that less than ever. We're all on Paxil and shit, but um, no, yeah, that'd be nice. Uh, I'm thinking, we were talking last week about the bioidentical uh, hormone replacement therapy that um, makes all the old people so horny. You got to look into this. It's a game changer. Some people don't have, anyway, um, tangential. What is that? You got a little tea? Yeah, a little echinacea. Ooh, yeah, lovely. What is that, like an herb? Mm -hmm. sure. It's a flower. It's the purple cone flower. 
Oh yeah. Okay. It boosts immunity, you know, the COVID. So we were talking about, um, my whole basis of wanting to rap. So I took, it took 21 months for me to figure out that like, literally I went into a studio about a week and a half after this all happened. And I had never, I hadn't even written a song yet. All I knew was I needed to to learn the, and start the process. I had to go and I knew nothing, nothing. And I show up, you know, and this guy's a multimillionaire and is, has recorded some nice people. I mean, he's not, he's not a recording artist um, or a, a producer. He does it on the side. He's a construction business owner. He's a very wonderful man. I get up there. I'm just like, I'm, I'm going to be famous. You don't even understand. And he was like, who is this woman? But I'm so passionate and so convincing. And I had one song and I made it. And I've made that song, I think, six times now. And it's still not right. And then I wrote, I've written 120 songs. Um, and, and none of them are very good, it turns out. And it turns out that it's, here's what I've learned over 21 months of being slightly delusional. Um, it's very difficult to make something that people actually want to listen to repeatedly. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's almost like it's an accident. Like it's a lottery. It's almost like it's hard to know because you're not going to finish something that you think is garbage. Yeah. But people finish a lot of stuff that doesn't stay popular. I have seven copies of the Backstreet Boys last album still in the cling film on my pool table behind me. Because they come with the tickets now. That's how they that's how they get record sales now. Is they they pay for the tickets. They did like one song from that album. And then it was their Las Vegas show from two years ago, which is nothing but hits. But one of the best shows I've ever seen. But that's an, I'm sure that was a million dollar record for them to make. You know, there's engineers and every and you're an A list act. You're not getting discounts on anything. So right. But. I couldn't even, I couldn't name one song in that album if you held a gun to my head, unless the title track is a thing that exists. But even then, I'm not 100%. To make a, a big sound. And so here, here I am just pushing, pushing, pushing. I've been doing it for 15 years, trying to, you know, I mean, um, so I'm in your same boat. I totally get like not knowing what's going to be good. And then you hear stories all the time of songs that ended up people really do love that the artist thought it was garbage or whatever. So, I mean, we could go on and on about that. You were saying. Well, and I'm not young. And so I, and I, here's the thing, I, I would go back and forth um, on whether or not my music, and I've done these parodies, like I've done eight parodies now, just retakes on what I think are the most egregious, offensive, misogynistic hip hop songs from the catalog from early days. So it's mostly old school stuff that I've rewritten, kind of a weird Al take on a couple songs, which I honestly, I'm proud of the work I've done, especially on Dr. Dre's uh, Housewife and of course the Sir Mix-a-Lot remake that I did. The the Housewife clap back? Housewife and Baby Got Back, or I'm sorry, Fella Got Slack. Like I legitimately lot, proud of those. A lot of this stuff is on YouTube? It's all on YouTube. Yeah, I'm Zaza, Good Break. That's who I am everywhere. D-A-Z-A-G-O-O-D-B-R-A-K-E. Yeah. That's never going to change. We can link that stuff. I mean, in the in the show description or whatever, I'm not as worried about that as much as I just wanted to make sure we were on the same page that like, yeah, because um, I don't know if I've heard a final kind of uh, cut of the housewife thing, but I remember talking about it early when you had the idea and I, I love the idea. Of that song I am it's Tracy's favorite he did all my mastering settings just based on that song because I was aw- I was so angry that day and I had it you know like and, anger and all that you see very successful artists struggling with this also but you see a lot of trying to capture what was so great for them previously mm-hmm. and then trying to apply those to apply those same concepts or settings or environments or whatever to new things and it's really hard it's really hard to to recreate some of that but um no yeah when it sounds really great and it's locked in like that yeah you want to capture all that all that memory so then i needed to come up with original content and i keep getting stuck on um you know just various you know people telling me my beats were whack some of them which you made some of which i love um and I fuck you if my you think my beats are whack my bars are sick so go fuck yourself you know is actually how i feel about it I like the beats we made together, V. 
and I would like to make more beats with you. Oh, I'd love to see those those projects through. I think it'd be especially um, considering that's the kind of music that's really great to release and promote digitally, and that's kind of our limit, right? Because you're not necessarily going around town doing 90 minute sets, even if that was an option right now. <laughs> no. Having content though that we've that we've honed that we really enjoy, I would love to get back into some of that stuff. I have a lot of it still, and um, my part of the process really just involves me trying to help my computer make drums happen, and then I do like bass lines on one of my synths mostly, which is so much fun. It's so great, and then you know I have my little vocal booth here in my coal box, honey. Forget about it. We run you a cable under the door. I love that. Um, so I, I, okay, so I oscillate between just being just delusional, um, completely delusional. And I had this AR from Universal very interested in developing my sound and the work. And I tried to find some funding because the lawyers at Universal said, hell no, St. Louis, Missouri, 41 years old. That's just a no and a no. But this, this AR really thinks, you know, I'm onto something. He's like, Good break, you come up with one thing, I've got you. I'm like, I'm just trying to make that one thing right now. Overhead and, is much more minimal than it was, you know, even 10 or 20 years ago with, you know what I mean? Like you don't ever have to put out something on a, on a CD that's gonna sit on a shelf somewhere until, you know, um, and, and the, until there's a demand for that. Like it's, there's not the only avenue, so. No, there's so many ways to do it. I have no excuse for, for, so, I, you know, then I go back and forth. I had, oh, here's the thing, right before the pandemic hit, I wore this outfit. Yeah. And yeah. it was so great. Yeah. Loving, uh, loving it. I performed at Pops and I opened up for MC Chris, who is the dorkiest rapper of all time. And- I love it. Was I gigging that night? Is that why I wasn't there? Was it a Friday? It was a Friday. I must have been at the casino. You were. You were. Um, I, I, I don't know, like 150 people there. And I actually did a full 40-minute set without skipping. I, I dropped one line and recovered really well. I did nine songs in a row. And I danced my ass off and had really great feedback. Pretty easy. I, it's hard for me to pull that off, to sing and perform. Mm -hmm. or two separate things you know what I mean sort of vocalize in your case and dance and remember original material that's new and you know I mean and then I start sweating I get all greased up and then I get in my eyes and my glasses fall off and it's a mess but and I also played my violin for part of it and I really think that night and and you know what if nothing ever comes but for that night at least I had one really cool night and um I'm, I was capable of doing it and, and knowing that I could actually deliver that many songs that were fully memorized that I wrote by my own hand um, and performed and, and, and it was just really satisfying and I am at heart a performer and an entertainer above all else. Um, I just love being on stage and getting the audience involved and getting people up to dance like that's what I want to do. Well now, good for your show at the level that it is being that it's it's new and emergent and um uh but also that as an opening spot that's a really great idea like that, and that's a really great approach to being an opener for a headlining traveling act like that also do we mm -hmm. have we have this documented somewhere even if it's just for our scholarship i have it videoed yeah okay good just even if it's just for us because, you know, that's a huge part of my thing now is like we did that live record, um, Jacob V and, and my, my yes. band did that live record last year that um, uh, it's just like, I didn't know we, COVID was going to happen a year later, but right. you know, I can drive around and, and listen to it. And it sounds like you're there. It sounds like you're in that room mm -hmm. and you can kind of start to smell it. And, you know, you can remember being sweaty. It was kind of hot in the, you know what I mean? And like, so. Um, I was there that night. Yeah, and so that document is so is so great. I got this little camera that I'm shooting this with right now that has really great microphones on it for for live shows, and it's just so good to document that stuff. And you notice that some people have done that their whole career, and then they ended up using it later. But mm -hmm. hold on to that video because we're gonna need it when we send 
when we when we send some good ones up the pipe because we're gonna put that in like the Patreon subscription, they're gonna have access to that secret early bootleg footage. The thing is, my, the, the, the thing is, my early is too late. But mom's like, my whole thing is, and for one. This is part of what I wanted to get to is so, okay. So just to recap where we've been real quick. Uh, I'm a musician. Um, you're a, a, a lifelong violinist and in the past year or so recently, uh, two, two years, a rapper, two years. Uh, two years now. That's what I thought. And uh, amongst other things, but um, also your message is part of um, that's really what it's about for you is it's not about, it's not, a, even though you work on these things and they become, really great skills that you craft it's not about just making hip-hop music that you like like I have a friend who I'm not going to name because it's not going to sound flattering who is a very very talented and and kind of high level functioning um hip-hop artist but it's all very good timey hey we're partying hey we got um honeys in the joint you know what I mean it's not necessarily a politically or socially focused approach and that's the opposite of your thing you're less about um, oh, I want to make hip hop and more about, I want to use hip hop to convey uh, a, a, a spirit that I'm feeling and a messaging that I'm getting that I want to relay to other people. Am I, am I, is that an in, inaccurate summation? No, that's perfect. Okay. So tell me about that. So this is where I think we're going is tell me about what you're trying to, who you're trying to speak to or, or speak for, and then tell me about that. So um, I could, I, I think globally, I'm an internationalist since birth. Um, and it's still legal to beat your wife in a very large amount of countries. In a yeah, I didn't know we were going there, but yes, I totally, this is exactly where I wanted to go. Please. So we'll just start there. Um, abortion is still very illegal in many, many countries. Divorce is unheard of in many countries and women's- legal In Ireland, like a couple of years ago, they made it legal finally. That's correct. Um, I, it was in the early 2000s. Um, so my entire, epiphany if you will not only fueled is fueled by this insanity of american motherhood mm. which is absolute oh. it's an impossible job not only is it thankless people say that all the time but it's also like impossible considering especially now you guys have to work like remember like back in the day you, now you gotta work full-time like you have like your own health insurance and shit like it's not even like the housewife thing at least you got to stay in the house it's like the Ali Wong, which is there's a comedian. I don't know if you know her, but she had a joke that like when women, are, when, when she hears women say things like, um, like, well, what if we want to, she's like, bitch, shut up. I don't want to have to take the trash out. <laughs> so the, uh, <clears throat> the insurmountable amount of unpaid labor that women contribute to the capitalist system, I find uh, infuriating. So um, this, the capitalist system in general um, women contribute a vast amount to, and it basically gives us nothing. Um, we'll always finish last. Women and children will always finish last. We will not benefit from a system which we contribute our free labor to consistently throughout our entire lives. Not only that, but we have to, um, the free labor, it, it, it spans the entire life cycle, whether or not you choose to have children. And, and, and you don't have to have a uterus to to be considered in this group of people either. I don't wanna um, I give a shout out to my non-binary and, and, and gender non-conforming friends because I would include everyone born with a uterus or anyone not identifying as male in this group of people. Sure. So American motherhood though, you wake up one day and then like this thing is you're supposed to, you're not supposed to, but what's modeled to you is that your identity is basically shot and you get a license plate that says like Caleb's mom and suddenly you devote your entire life to your kids. Um, and that's just bullshit. It's assumed. It's, it's assumed. Such an important thing that my therapist asked me about when we got engaged was make sure you have conversations about not only whether or not you want to have children, but how you want your roles to be in your daily life because even though you already live together those could change if your expectations are different from what a husband and a wife are supposed to do every day and so yeah if you want to have relationships with pretty much anybody they're going to try to impose that gender expectation on you and they may not align with what you want to subscribe to and participate in 
Well, I just think monogamy is for suckers in the first point. Um, second of all, women have two faces. Like you don't have to, I'm just tired. And, and this is a, a big thing in, the, in, in, in pop culture, not just hip hop or whatever, but that the hotties are in the club. Like, I'm sorry, but moms, you know, one of my favorite lines is I'll make a PBJ in two minutes flat, but I can make you come twice as fast as that. Like, I will turn around from the kitchen and get you in the bathroom and do have my way with you. And I can live both of those lives. Every woman has two faces. And you don't have to sacrifice that sexiness, that identity, and you don't have to go to the club to express it either. You can dance in your kitchen and make it just as a wonderful, like life is supposed to be a joyous experience and we're co-creating it together. And your kids don't have to be this reason to cloister yourself or pin yourself down to this lower version of yourself. Like that's just bullshit. A more modest or muted that version of your um because it was it was your choice to have children and so in doing that kind of yeah right yeah <laughs> it's a separate issue but um but also the um so in doing that you can choose to do that and not um defer any of your other liberties right and i didn't know shit about i mean i was i mean but i mean i don't care who knows my full story i was in a sexless marriage for 12 years in a sexless marriage is anything that's you know three times or less a year i had sex three times and had two babies no i'm not mormon um i just i married someone that was not a lover i married like a brother i guess you would say and so i spent 10 years sort of incubating and ruminating over these feelings kind of like moses walking through the desert and when you deny your urges for that long one thing does happen you forget about them first of all and then they manifest in different ways. And so I perhaps experienced such an extreme personality shift during this period where I became a rapper. And I truly believe that's what I'm, I because want it was to do. After for your, for that part of your life too, for the, um, the sort of conventional limitations that you had been living under, you were kind of exiting that phase anyway. At the it was coming to an end, yes. Yeah, at the same time that you were discovering this new art form. And so- you know, It was like a nexus or like a supernova. It was a total paradigm shift. Like a, a, you, were ch you were changing several kind of important things at once. Once. Uh, like you, from a fire hose, it was amazing. Or, you know, yeah, it was, it was a, over, overall a positive change because it's um, still- Oh, I would do it again and again. I loved every minute of it, although some parts were really scary. And she, got crazy. she got crazy. There was the time. Yeah, you know. I remember sitting down with you and be like, look, I'm going to be so famous. This is totally happening. You better get ready. And you're just like, okay. And you never cracked a smile. You just looked at me and you're like, okay. Well, how do I know? I mean, my, I mean, my job doesn't have anything to do oh, with it. Oh, you were so good to me and like, just fielded my delusions and 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 absorbed them. You, know, you need a baseline. You need a little boom clap. I got it. The rest of that stuff was all on you. That you had to make that other stuff happen. I was excited to be along for the ride. <laughs> now it, this doesn't. This isn't. I mean, I still completely believe in my ability to incite an international feminist revolution with hip hop music. I want to make birth control free for the entire population. I want everyone to have somewhere to go to the bathroom every day and basic calories for the world. I think I can do that still. I really do. Like, I I, that's I, why I wake up in the morning. I don't think people overall disagree with that either, especially when you're talking on a global scale. There are countries where they have laws about everyone needs to have X, Y, Z to eat every day. I've seen on the Travel Channel, like it's, you know, some places it's bread, some places it's X, you know, it's whatever, but like, um, the bathroom thing, I keep thinking about a funny story we used to tell at lunch. Uh, you know what I mean? I, but like, that's important. Like when I, you know, I am horribly addicted to to carbonated beverages and I'm driving around playing Pokemon Go with my dogs. It's sometimes I don't know where I'm going to pee. And I want to live in a world where um, people aren't peeing on the street. You know what I mean? So we got to figure out. And you know what? It kind of goes back to some of the issues we were talking about earlier with homelessness and, um, uh, 
if you kind of look at the macro kind of problem, there's nowhere where we want that to kind of be the case, right? So yes, like you're saying, the so those issues that you still want to to challenge and kind of confront, you absolutely could still do those. I need just one hit, and I'm going to give it all away. Like I'll, I'll channel it. You'll ch channel it into a stream of uh, those things. Clean water. I mean, more people have cell phones on this world than have a shitter to go to the toilet in. Like well, you all the sharing. You know what? I really don't like to share. That's why we don't rent out that upstairs bedroom to a roommate is because there's no bathroom up there. I'm like, yeah, coming down here to my bathroom, honey. Not today, Satan. So that's part of, and, and, and our concept of space, I mean, our concept of everything in this country, I actually think that the Post-Dispatch is going to publish my letter to the editor this week, but Americans, you know, if you want it, we're not going to get into this right now, but our culture is our culture is having a really hard time with what's happening right now and our culture is directly working against us because we're supposed to have it our way and our individual freedoms and liberties are the most important things against all else and right now they're not do you feel like there are people that disagree with you about that do you feel like there are people either older or younger than you that disagree about go ahead and say that again about the the liberties and the because i and and let's talk about some of those people because i i feel like you and me are like the kind of people that get are so guilty of getting stuck in a bubble of people that agree with us like we were totally blinded uh what blindsided in 2016 and the results of the election and like we just didn't think it was an option you know what i mean so for some of my listeners um just who are some of those people in a vague sense that that are that disagree with those things so apart from, let's just take all the politics out of it. Let's just look at cultural yeah. um, values. And if you look at the Hofstetter Index, which Hofstede, I'm sorry, it's Hofstede Index. It's an index that compares countries to countries on different metrics. How well does your cultural deal with, culture deal with uncertainty avoidance? Like this idea of we don't know exactly what's gonna be happening tomorrow or the next day. How well does your culture deal with? Um, and there's five metrics on there. The, only one of them really applies to what's going on right now with our healthcare crisis. Um, the reason I've been to 40 countries, the reason I've spent more than two years out of my uh, out of the country in my life is because I love this country. And I'm always searching for what it means to be an American. And the one thing I keep coming back to these days is that we are raised through advertising, through our family structure, through our schooling, that our individual rights are above all else. You are the person and what you believe your individual choice freedom and independence is the most important and economically it translates the best and so that's what we go with that's what we push through the advertising venue but you can do anything you want if you work hard enough you can buy, have it your way all of these messages come to us are you are you mad at burger king I mean, it's the best slogan to illustrate my point. That's a good point. Because it represents a lot of, it's also Subway's point. Yeah, it, it, it's everyone's point because it works. Which which you fill out the puzzle on the bag? It works incredibly well. So here we have something where- If, right? That's always been my problem with that is you could do anything you want if, and we were saying on my podcast last week that we were talking about um, my parents creating a, a higher starting point for my brother and I than they had, right? You And you improve on what you start out with. And that's really all you can do. Some people improve farther and faster than others, but um, that's asking a lot. You have to be kind of the exception to the rule. And what you're talking about is people are not starting with the same thing. And that's why we have so, so much of this disagreement about how to solve some of these issues. Well, here, here, here comes an idea though, it for this just, it's a, what I'm calling a great global pause. This is the great global pause, right? We have to step off and say, 
I'm sorry, just for right now, you can't have it your way. We are asking that you put your individual rights, freedoms and responsibilities to on hold, wear a mask and stay home. This is what we want you to do. Please. Please. And we have no clear national policy on this. We can't even seem to get a county policy. And as far as you and I go, the people that are trying to participate in that, you would love to be in my basement right now having this conversation, but we're trying to behave and be safe. Yeah, there's no way I would come there because- The thing too, though, is people forget when someone says, stay home, wear a mask, be safe, wash your hands, they are also planning to do those things. Like no one is, and, it, and this is why people get mad when people try, when politicians try to do things against those kind of rules or whatever, but we all are trying to say, let's all do this so that we can all stay safe, right? Like, you cannot have it your way right now. Get yeah. the fuck over it. You, you fucking babies. You can't go to Chuck E. Cheese right now and share a soda with nine people. You can't do it. It's just not, you're all going to die. I'm trying to protect you. It's a, it, and this is where it does bleed into politics because it does have to do with the collective good, right? It is not every person for themselves. It is not the will of free choice. It is not independence. It is this idea that we are in this together and that we need to have a collective agreement to do something that is selfless and for the community good. And America sucks at that. Yeah. And that the virus is so fucking successful. Why do you why do you think we suck at that? Because of all the points I just made. The, the reason our country was invented was everything against what we're trying to go for right now. That's a great point. It's just it's counterintuitive. And we've been we're we're talking about 10 generations in, mm. but you know, at, at least I mean, definitely since World War II, at least a hundred years since the last pandemic, we've like this really works. This makes a lot of money. This makes people believe in the future. If they just think that they can get something better, if they work just for themselves, every man for themselves, it just works that way. Forget the women and children. We don't have to pay them. And forget the people who uh, get left in our wake, who don't have the resources to complete the education or the training, or, um, or in so many cases, they don't have the either physical or mental capacity and we are really struggling with that mental capacity right now and not that we're not doing enough for people that are inhibited cognitively is what i'm saying you know, although that is so important but also mental health i mean huge especially the homeless problem right now um completely stone sober people are not homeless for very long no. right and you know homelessness um can't be kind of uh you kind of get into a rhythm and a using pattern of whatever your um thing is in la right now it's all you know meth and cheap filthy heroin and no yeah yeah and um we we just really do a bad job of of that part so we address a lot of these issues on the show actually and um and last week we were talking about uh specifically like since world war ii it's like a lot of those people their kids are are the ones that are in charge really right now. Um, and some of the people are even still alive, but uh, they're also getting so much older. And so we're just seeing like, it's kind of um, like a, like a blimp kind of running out of juice as it's going. And then it's pulsate. I don't know why it's pulsating in my motion here, but, uh, and so that's the thing is that, so yeah, it really worked great for the people that sprinted towards the top and they got off at their little tears down the hierarchy but there's too many people that don't have a, a literally a place to eat or, or go to the bathroom and i think a meritocracy is a little you know that we live in is a little bit of a sham and also when you get to the examples like bezos and buffett and these runners of google you know i call me a socialist, but I just don't think you need more than $100,000 a month. Like you are setting your family up and your children up for future success, but how much wealth do you really need in your world right now? Well, and even if the cap was higher, even if the cap was, uh, uh, I mean, there's so much, 
it's got a the idea that you you and me have talked about this with a colleague before when you have all this capital working in a system if it's all getting kind of stuck in one place and it's not coming back out mm -hmm. think of it a game of hungry hungry hippos if, if, <laughs> You can't get very far in the game if the, one of the hippos doesn't spit the balls back out at some point. Exactly. You know what I mean? It's like um, uh, if I played skee ball and the balls never came back down the thing, it's like that's not going to be a very long game. Well, it hasn't been a very long game because if you really look at it blossoming after the Industrial Revolution, we had two really great world wars, which really allowed us to subsidize our um, you know, the blossoming of our economy and our middle class suburban lifestyle and whatnot. But those numbers of people, even in the upper half of that, are shrinking. Mm -hmm. And the money's kind of all staying there. And now we got seven and a half billion hippos and, on the planet and not enough of the, you know what I'm saying? Like, is that where we're going? The thing is, is I, 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 I had a very intense but brief bout with insomnia when I was in third grade because I had the severe realization that our overconsumption in the United States directly related to the rest of the world's suffering. My children will consume 800 times more resources than almost any other child on the planet. What right or uh, the audacity of our culture to believe that we have that we're entitled to that why well, and so much of it is so wasted and this is what drives me crazy is that as taxpayers for example because people like to identify themselves as such that we could demand um a little better of a job from the people that we're paying taxes to to um, improve things like that, food waste, um, homelessness, and food insecurity amongst children in this country is at zero, so it's too high. And um, and the way that that's set up is like we're also like throwing so much stuff away. There, and there's people who are very affluent in other countries who brush their teeth out of a bowl of water so they don't run water the whole time. Totally. You would totally be grossed out by that. But like, think, I mean, two minute showers i haven't showered in days because i care about the world <laughs> and i have wet wipes and i don't flush them i bury them in the yard no i think that the i i i'm throwing up and we're both throwing up all of these you know issues and there are a lot of issues in this world do i have a lot of solutions i'm not sure however i'm never going to stop speaking truth to power and I will not quit, you know, demanding that women have equal pay for equal work, which is such a fucking loaded term because 80% of the work I do doesn't get paid. Like majority of my life has been, has, I've spent most of my life doing unpaid labor. And then the stuff you get paid for, we historically don't get paid enough for. Oh, it's pathetic. And then in any other industry, you would make less money than I would doing the same job. I made twice as much at age 27. Yeah, like we worked at a phone bank selling knives or something. I, I've done, no, no knives. I sold steaks for a while, but That's as a vegetarian. But I sold, I worked in the phone company. I don't eat this garbage, but you're going to love it. <laughs> Frozen, it's vacuum packed. I'll give you some herb butter. Fry ice and everything. And can I add on four four ounce boneless pork chops for you? Nine ninety nine. For four pork chops? Four four ounce boneless po pork chops. It was an add on. I was the queen of add ons. Can you still do that? I'm never not adding four pork chops for nine dollars. Dude, well, this was um, a little bit ago. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> I'm gonna say, don't let me see a two dollar pork chop in this economy. <laughs> I could sell a T-bone, a ribeye. They had ribeyes then? Oh, yeah. Omaha Steaks? I mean, they ship to both coasts on dry ice all the time. Yeah, their Christmas deal is crazy. I haven't seen the one for this year. I bet it came out today. <gasps> Not a sponsor. The packages we sold. But before that, I did market research for Gallup and we see research. But that was way more interesting because I would call people and ask them about their political opinions all over the country. I would call and interrupt your dinner and ask you about like Bill Clinton. And it was so fun because I could just- 
right now because that industry seems to be so um so obsolete now with the two major elections in a row that they kind of got wrong but <laughs> yeah what's up with the polling people just flat out lying i know that's been a while since you did this professionally but can you tell me what is the um the average responder oh my gosh can i tell you my favorite response ever because you called all over the country at random. And this is when people still had landlines, right? This is in the mid nineties, late nineties. And we would ask people demographic questions at the end. And I was calling Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And I said, sir, just for classification purposes, do you consider yourself a Democrat, a Republican or an independent? And he said, well, I don't know. I never was too good at geology. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then CNN would, thank you for that dance. Um, CNN would ask really loaded questions like, do you think Al Gore's environmental policies are too extreme? Yes or no? That's not a non-biased question, if you ask me. Especially because those people that you're calling don't know what the fuck they're talking about. So yeah, um, I would say overall, I mean, I called Manhattan for two years because I could talk really fast and I would make, I made so much money at those places as a college student, like I made good money. Like we're talking. That was the birth of your flow was on the phone saying, sir, thank you so much for that package of ribeyes. Would you like me to go ahead and add on a four ounce, four pack of four ounce pork chops, nine ninety? <laughs> no, darling. I was double state champion, humorous and dramatic interpretation in high school as well. No one has broken the state title. Why that shit in schools because you're still using that shit to sell steaks to the great people of Omaha. The great people. No one in Omaha bought it though. It was California and New Jersey. Is that just where the cows were? Was in Omaha? Yeah, all the. I mean, all that corn-fed beef and the the corn. The cows don't want to eat corn. V. They don't. I, I think it's fuel. I don't think it's food. I don't. It makes, it makes them sick. Yeah, it makes them. Yeah, they, if you feed them grass. She had all that E. coli because it you something about the corn that yeah, we saw the same movie. Well, you don't get the marbleization and the fatty tissue as much as if you feed them corn is like gets them fat fast. But the thing is, like you could feed 98 people or something, or two people, like the difference in you know, the consumption and all of this. We could just feed a lot more people if we ate a little bit simpler. Um and I, I, I do believe nutritionally that America, that, and that is one other part of COVID, like culturally we're suffering from a problem with just shifting to this group think, like, let's just be collective for a second. Let's think about our community and all of this. But at the same time, I think nutritionally, unfortunately, we are a sick nation. Um, we are not well, and we have a lot of underlying comorbidities, as Dr. Brick says. And I think that, no one's really taking that to task like head on, like 60% of our country has one of the underlying health conditions that, that COVID um, really prefers in a body to ravage it. And that's really sad. And um, I think a lot of the, the world is, is looking at us, you know, we've been the envy of a lot of the world because of our entertainment industry for many, many decades. And we are, the whole the, the American dream is something to be sought after and a lot of people know that we have a very good life here but now it's kind of like don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain because we're ill we're not able to pivot and unfortunately we're not listening to directions and if if, if you don't listen to your teacher which unfortunately our teacher is our principal at this point and our principal is our president, he's not giving a consistent policy or message that says, we really need to pull together. Everybody needs to be in this on the same page. We just need to mitigate and, and try and, and lower these numbers. And they're doubling and doubling and doubling and we're losing more and more people. I, mean, I try to anchor these conversations with, um, with this kind of caveat that uh, what do you think average people, the people that you're hoping hear this, what do you, what do you want them to kind of move forward um, with to, to improve those issues in their lives like in a general sense well just what would you recommend what do you okay let me let me make it about you i know that's a lot of pressure what are you what are you going to do every day to try to to try to improve that issue so i've stopped doing almost everything recently 
Um, the only thing I do is skate 11 miles at Forest Park every day. And then I will go to Aldi or Trader Joe's every other week. Um, my children are at public school. I teach remotely, um, but that's it. I don't see friends, I don't see family or anything because um, I know that if I catch it, I'm in trouble, first of all. Um, and also, I really am, have enjoyed this time to retreat and reflect and really root down into what I want out of my life. And I'm, I was overstimulated first. I will never go back to the way I was living before. I don't even think that's an option. No. I'm certainly not. I mean, the idea of going to multiple places with people in them in a day sounds impossible. You know what I mean? Whereas I used to be all over town all the time I used to be eating out three meals a day and I'd go hang out at a, at a club or a bar even if I wasn't partying or something just to I mean there's always something to do and now it's like uh, I don't even want to it's so it's just so radically different so I don't think you're alone there and I think that's such an important thing to validate is nobody wishes that all of this happened but we've learned a lot about ourselves and what we want in the opportunity we are going to carry out of this a lot of wisdom um i hope so i'm making radical changes to my life to to try to just improve it um since we had this time to kind of be alone with our choices and our yeah you know. and I, I, yeah like i said i yeah i i'm we're both very very social people yeah. we're very connected with our communities we thrive on groups we thrive in environments that are re that recharge us like the fact that we're sitting here and having this conversation and thinking positively about our experience is pretty incredible because uh, i honestly don't know if you would have described it to me a year ago if i would be like oh hell no i couldn't do that i'm doing great like this is okay mm -hmm. um it's it's actually better than okay because I don't feel like I'm just juggling my children and shifting them and placing them places just to get the get the job done. Like I'm their fucking mom, hundred percent now. I don't know if I I could have said that before this. So because your life was so different, and yeah, totally. I totally agree. It's great. Um, I would like to perform again someday. Um, great. I. I will say that the hip hop community has continued on like nothing has changed and that's a little bit difficult for me. I've turned down a lot of gigs and um, just had to say, you know, this is just not, that's not me right now and I'm just not gonna take any part of it, nor am I gonna attend a show, period, like no. But I can support by watching online, I make a lot of comments, I stream a lot and I just- a lot, Like the real grassroots level artists um right now we're they, yeah they're moving on to online platforms and trying to figure out a way to connect with their audience in a way that's safe for their audience mm -hmm. like um all my favorite drag queens are doing twitch shows like twitch you should just be chubby kids playing Fortnite, and now it's you know it's everything it's anything you want to do and you know, <laughs> um, is uh we do it on youtube and uh, eventually we'll be streaming once i get a i think i need to buy a new computer honestly but we'll be streaming to twitch and youtube and facebook simultaneously hey. so it's i mean it's a great time um to be an artist at your own level because you're not competing with stuff that people are going to be at enterprise or shape it's or some or doing it's you know? an incredible it's incredible diy moment in in history i feel very lucky to be alive in such a chaotic time and i hope that you and yours uh, and me and mine make it through to the other side because, and, and also as an impulsive, very type A um, experience addict as I am, it's almost exhilarating to wake up every day and be like, well, I could die tomorrow. Let's just keep, and it's really true. It's liberated me from my FOMO. Yes. I'm not missing out on anything. No. There's not a damn thing. There's nothing good out there to go do unless you're talking about, you know, sitting on a patio in November. <laughs> Seriously. Know? There's no options. And when you are brought with no options, you really are looking in the mirror and taking a deep 
you know, just a deep look at, you know, what's important. And, and I've, I've come up with some great stuff. I've slowed down on, on actually delivering songs because when George Floyd died, someone told me to shut the fuck up. White feminism is death and you are a bitch. And I was like, huh. And I kind of believed them for a minute. And I, I don't anymore, but I did need to, to stop for a second. And I read a bunch of books and I listened to all these audiobooks and got in touch with my white privilege and got in touch with white supremacy and tried to like, just figure out, you know, I had suburban angst from age six on. Like I, 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 I'm not saying that I was woke in kindergarten, but I, I was woke by second grade. Um, that doesn't mean that I still don't have extreme implicit bias and did not need to say a lot of shit this summer. There's no, there was no room for it. And so now I'm taking stock and figuring out how to, how to navigate that. This there will never be a post-racial world, but where white feminism and mom mom rap fits into all of it. I don't even know if there is a place for mom rap in the world. You don't identify as a white feminist. You happen to be... I huh? happen to be white, and I'm a globalist. I'm a globalist. I'm an internationalist. Sure. Right. Yeah. So, But that's the thing, is that it felt like, oh, this is a suburban white lady acting like she's woke, but she doesn't understand the real, because you weren't a part of the racial group that you were trying to speak right. to or for or whatever at the time. Not that you were trying, again, yes, absolutely. I, my, my message has always been very global and very international focused. And so if we took it out of the black community of St. Louis, like it, it just wasn't the right time. So now it, 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 the time is coming again where, where the platform could probably be reintroduced and I've gotten some some really cool ideas and I'm you know who wants to preach you just have to talk about your own life and your own experience and it just takes one hit so I'm working on that you know just working on that I'm excited to be a part of that process so I don't want to I don't want to forget to leave anything out of course so I, I do want to shout out again um our friend Mr. Tracy and and uh, who we lost recently and and uh, loved dearly and he gave so much to the music community both locally and and beyond. And um, I want to talk about where people can find um, what music you do have available currently and where they may see forwarding uh, in the future. Uh, I know we're Zaza Good Break on YouTube and Instagram. Yeah. Insta well, we'll see my pictures are the most exciting part of my life lately because I, I realized that I wanted to use everything I have to speak towards my messages. And it turns out that if you work out as much as I do and discover your sexuality at age 40, I have this really beautiful body that I like to share with people. And I almost got fired over it recently because I believe that a woman's body is her own to share. And I do believe that the human, like women's breasts are instruments of peace and that they should not be pornographic. And so I am really, really revealing on my Instagram pictures and they're very arousing. And I don't mean to turn everyone on with them. I'm just making the art that I want to reflect um, and, and what I'm feeling in the moment and the, the way I wanna get my messages across. Um, and so my Instagram is Zaza Goodbreak. And if you, I had, to, I had to make it private because it was a little bit scandalous. It's not pornographic and I don't have an OnlyFans page, but I could make porn. I'm not going to. Well, you're, inv I mean, you're inviting followers, but it's just not there for anyone's mom to go find. Oh, uh, moms do go find it. That's the whole point. Their moms, like grandmas to go find. Grandmas too, just no students that are 18 or younger. That's oh. it. And I think that's fair. I, we do that with this podcast too. It doesn't necessarily ever cover super sexually explicit material, but we do like to just keep the kids out the room as an option. And I do think that my, the reason that I make these pictures and the content that I do and the music that I do, because it is controversial and it is offensive. Like my family cannot stand the music that I make and they haven't talked to me in a, two years now because of it, because they don't like the content of my message. Um, but really, I want women to go out and have the boudoir shots. I want women to feel elevated and sexy even after they have children. And no matter, 
I'm body positive, no matter what you identify as, what you want to wear. I dressed as a fucking man for like most of my life and had a butch ass haircut and dated a woman. You know, I've been there, you name it, I've done it. Give me a break. I love living life and I want to share it with people. And so you should follow me on on my Instagram and it'll become more exciting over the years, I think. It's a real, it's a real journey. I love that. I love being a part of this journey. I love that you came on uh, Jacob B Weekly to share this with people because I think um, I get a lot of questions about uh, my friend with the green jumpsuit. Oh. And- <laughs> I missed your wedding. Can we do it again? I know. I, after while we, it was happening, I'm like, can we just do this every Saturday? We got free Ted Drews. Oh the incredible. Um, it was great. Absolute hit. You know, that was a brothel back in the day, that building. The old rock house? Yeah, for years. My God. Your wedding was the best produced wedding I've ever been to. It was a, it was a major life goal of mine. It was something I had been crafting um, for a long time. I didn't have the other, the, uh, the, the spouse figured out yet until you know i was with my wife but i had a lot of those other details kind of in my pocket kind of thinking oh my god did it show i felt like from beginning to end i was in a movie that's great that's so great za i love you so much i'm so glad we got to do this Uh, i I want you to come back when you have new material you want to promote you have to come premiere you heard it here first deal oh wait this is the sign this is the this is the old piece right this is how people do peace but this is the sign of the divine feminine and she's coming back. And these are the men's legs sitting down. That's what all men need to sit the fuck down. And these are the legs of the goddess coming out of the earth. I love that. The rebirth is coming. We must believe it. I'm love crazy and I love it. I love you. I'll see you soon. I'll see you soon. Bye, darling. Thank you.